<sighs> All right, let me start this over because I screwed something up. Um, I'm going to be talking today about beating myself up as a creative type. In the last year, I have, in the last year by, by which I mean um, the, since the last big Las Vegas writing class that I took from Chris and Dean, I have written about half a million words. I have been beating myself up going, but have you really accomplished anything? <laughs> uh, I, I feel like I, I have not. I intended to be done by the first of the year for the books to be much shorter, for everything to be much simpler and more straightforward. And it's just turning into this monster life consuming project. And I'm not getting done the amount of words per day that I feel like I should be. I, I've i gotten bogged down a lot. The first two books were in retrospect, uh, sorry, the first two books of this five book series um, in retrospect were pretty easy, although at the time they did not feel like that because they were such a stretch. But the further I get into this series, um, the more and more difficult it becomes to keep moving forward. And I understand that and I accept the reasons for that logically. The reasons for that, a lot of them are, um, this book is my therapy book and I have to have to make internal progress in order to make external progress on the book because the characters have to go through shit that I have yet to go through. Uh, they're further along their healing path uh, than I am. And I have to catch up if I'm going to write them convincingly and authentically. And even if I don't, even if I could have baked my way through it in writing smarter, healthier <laughs> more more capable characters than I am, I, I really don't want to. I, I'm using this book to drag myself out of a pit, and I had no idea the depth of the pit that I was in when I started dragging myself out. But wow, it is pretty hellacious and dark. So if this is what it takes, if, uh, it, you know, if writing at a crawl is what it takes to move forward, great. But I'm not actually convinced that it takes writing at a crawl anymore. I have... I think I'm at a point now where I'm starting to wrap up the worst and the hardest parts of coming out of this pit. I think I'm I'm not done by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm at the point where I kind of have to start over. This is a weird thought. Hmm. Uh, I wrote about this a little bit this morning, so I'll talk about it again and see if it shakes anything loose. Uh, there are a number of spiritual traditions where you kind of are in a loop, a time loop, if you will, where you have to do the same set of things over and over again um, until you get it right. And it's not like these loops are wasted time. Every time you go through one of these loops, it's kind of like, hmm, Edge of Tomorrow, I think it was, the movie with um, Tom Cruise in it where he kept getting ganked and in order to fight these um, these time tra time looped aliens uh, he and, and I think it was Emily Blunt in there anyway um, every time you go through one of these loops you learn something valuable or well you don't um, but you should be learning something valuable you should be getting some new experience that helps you figure something out um in Western traditions, this is the, the Wheel of Tarot, um, where you basically travel a path from uh, that that's marked by kind of positions in the cards called the Major Arcana that they go from the Fool card zero to the World card 22, 23, I can never remember which. My brain is fried. Anyway, you go th from the Fool to the World, but then if you stick at the World, things go bad. You kind of have to like drop everything you know and start all over again and go back to being the fool again. Um, in Zen tradition, this is a uh, beginner's mind. Uh, sometimes if you look at things from like bo regular Buddhism, not Zen Buddhism, 
you'd see like the wheel of karma, things like that, the wheel of reincarnation. And the good place, this is um, the period. <laughs> and this is the entire show, The Good Place. Never mind. What am I talking about? Uh, where they kept having to do everything again and again and again and again and again. And finally, they were just like, this is so stupid. I, we're just going to do the right thing because we've tried all of the stupid things. And we've tried the stupid things so often that we are so bored with them, we're going to do the right thing. That's kind of what it feels like. Anyway, I went through this a couple of times before, but it was a lighter version and I feel like it didn't affect me nearly as much. It just didn't tear me up the way this time is. Uh, this time I'm really taking my time with it, not pushing ahead when otherwise I would be because I have to be able to rate these characters authentically. So I'm letting things change me more deeply than they have in the past. Um, I don't know if I've learned anything. It doesn't feel like I'm a different person. It doesn't feel like I'm wiser. It doesn't feel like I'm better. I just feel slightly more tired. <laughs> like, ugh, I, I'm going to slow down and do this right, because if I don't, this book will not turn out right, and I'll freaking have to try and write it again in a different book. I will get stuck writing the same dang book over and over again until I die. And I don't, I hate that. I just don't want to do it. I want the book after this to be different. Um, yeah, I'm sure that doesn't go over well with readers, but oh well. It is what it is. So I've been working on that, and working really hard on that. And this morning, I kind of got stuff uh, related to the top of the spine and the head, which is kind of towards the end of the journey, unless you're wise enough to, to like be even more insightful and all the, all the other stuff that you're supposed to be able to do to release yourself from the wheel of fate. But uh, I got scary shit instead. Um, I don't know how quite to talk around this. Hmm. I'm pretty sure when I was a kid, my mom was just fucking mean. Um, not, I don't think she ever hit me. I don't think she shook me. I don't think she deliberately dropped me. You know, I, I don't think she left me to starve. I don't think she left me in a shitty diaper. I, I'm pretty sure that she didn't hold me close to her body and just kind of left me feeling literally insecure and unattached to her physically. Um, I think when I was very small, I was abandoned a lot and left to cry. I think that I was screamed, uh, I know that I was screamed at from conscious, from any level of conscious memory. That's like some of my earliest memories are being screamed at. Um, she is not a nice person. She is a, a terrified person. And it's taken me a long time to realize that she carries a very deep wound from her mom and her mom probably carries a deep wound for her mom and just generation after generation and that it came out in creating eldest girl child that basically just absorbed the damage of the rest of the family whatever whatever bad things happened they were that girl child's fault i i always find it very moving when i run into art of any any flavor that talks about inherited trauma that gets passed down uh, and like the struggles of people to not recreate that trauma in their own kids or even to just tune it out and find different choices in life. I, I, I just find it incredibly moving. I, I wish, I wish things were different with my mom. I tried really hard when I figured this out. I tried really, really hard to try and, and drag her across the line so that she wouldn't be trapped either. Um, when I had my daughter, that it was a constant battle in myself not to hurt her. 
and not to, to be mean to her and not to yell at her and not to be disappointed in her and not to be like, you were supposed to fix me. <laughs> like of all the dumb things, but I fought that. I, I fought it really hard and I think for the most part I won. I, I know there are definitely times that I failed, but I stopped and I backed up and I said, this is what I did to you and I am profoundly sorry for it. And it is my fault and it is nothing you did. So my daughter is pretty attached to me, pretty securely attached to me. And I'm, I'm super proud of that. Like anything else that <laughs> anything else that goes wrong in my life I still have that to fall back on like hey I did a great job uh, even if I didn't prepare her to like take over the world I certainly prepared her to like give a shit about other people and not to feel like she was just a complete and utter failure now she there were other problems in my family which were mostly my ex but that's another thing that I don't have to deal with today so, I, I've been dealing with this again, another loop of this, trying to realize that I'm dealing with generational trauma that happens in cycles and it go, you know, I, I didn't think about it for a while, so it kind of built up and so I had to purge it all and I had to relearn how to handle it better. This time, not just to protect my daughter, but to protect myself. This time around, I've been working on how to care for myself, how to be my own parent, how not to just be this raw thing walking around looking for someone to attach to, to keep me from hurting people, uh, to keep me from hurting myself. I'm, I'm learning to like myself. I can stand to listen to my own voice. I can look at myself in the mirror. I'm not ashamed of myself. I'm really not ashamed of anything I've done. I mean, I'll be ashamed of some things that I've done. And I will be just bitterly upset about them. But then if I can step back, I go, hey, <laughs> you were ashamed of you were ashamed of fucking up. And then you went and unfucked it as much as you possibly could. And now you're dedicating yourself to not never fucking that up again. I uh, hey, that's something to be proud of, even if there is some shame in it. Uh, so I'm not like generally ashamed of myself, which was not true before. Before, I would be like, you know, my whole life is an embarrassment. You know, it's not a same thing to think. But I think a lot of people do think that. They, they find themselves a terrible person, even when they're just kind of normal. Um, I know I did. Anyway, been going through this, sorting it out, to this morning, getting to the point of going, yeah, I think I, like, literally spent a lot of my childhood years, like my infant years, flinging my hands out trying not to fall because when I am upset that's what I do is like I don't fling my arms out but like everything up in my neck and back just locks up like that <sighs> like that's just an utter cramp there and if I'm in a mood where I'm like uh, I'm not safe and no one can challenge me because um, I, I, I just can't deal with any anymore feeling bad about myself that's what happens to my head and neck is I'm expressing that same physical pattern there of my shoulders rising up to my ears my chin tilting back and my neck thrusting forward like it's just it's it's almost comical how tight it is and I've been unfucking that so I'm doing all that had to deal with personal iterations of that this morning dealt with it thought I did great and then I got to this writing class. <laughs> and this writing class is called Killing a Critical Voice. I'm taking it because I feel like I'm not writing as fast or as well as I could be. I used to write super fast, super duper fast, but that was mostly for my ghostwriting clients. The stuff that I wrote for myself took longer. I didn't get as much done for myself as I did for other people. It is easy for me to throw my life down for someone else, it is hard for me to throw my life down for myself. Even if it benefits myself more to protect myself, to care for myself, to work for myself, it's just really hard. I feel like it's unsafe because it wasn't safe. There were no safe times in my life 
other than a span of a couple of years in college where I could afford to be myself. Uh, every other time I had uh, someone, uh, some asshole watching over me, controlling what I was doing and being very angry with me if I succeeded in doing anything for myself. Everything had to be for them or to make them look good. What successes I was allowed were there because they made me look good as arm candy, as a kid, or a spouse, it, or even as a parent. Um, and as soon as those things challenged any kind of internal sense of safety for my mom or my ex, those things got trashed. <sighs> Yuck. Eventually, I'll stop having to rehash that. Dear God. I hope it's soon. Probably not, though. I'll probably have to loop, out, loop it all around again. I'll have to barf out more. I guess that's just the way it's going to go. So, I'm taking this class about killing your critical voice, which is about killing uh, the things that are holding you back from being creative. Um, a lot of people are self-critical. I am one of them. I am... <laughs> I am almost epically analytical and a scary person to get any kind of criticism or feedback from because if I respond honestly then it's, it comes across as being brutal. If I respond dishonestly and tactfully it comes across as being um, pedantic and belittling. It's just a damned if you do or damned if you don't situation. A lot of that comes from the people who are listening but I'm not coming from a healthy place either. So, taking this class, first assignment, uh, I'm not going to say what the first assignment was because I'm trying really hard to make sure that the classes retain, that I'm taking from Chris and Dean retain their integrity for the people who are taking them, um, or who are in fact inspired to take them because of anything that I ever said or who coincidentally hear me <laughs> and then decide to take the classes. Anyway, um, I'm trying to keep things on the down low. So where you kind of want to take the class, you, you kind of know that it's going to be rough and you don't really have the process spoiled for you. So I'm not going to go into detail of what the assignment was exactly, but it was very upsetting. I, but none of it was new. None of the first class was new. This is a six-week class. The first, first class was just the basics. None of it was new. I had heard it all before. And I spent, like, the last three videos with my heart going 90 miles an hour and no ability to breathe. And, yes, my chest and shoulders and head locked up in the arms flung back, baby's going to be dropped position. I wanted to hurt somebody. I wanted to run. I So I finished the classes, got the assignment, took a break, sat down, did the assignment, felt awful, felt worse, and decided I was going out for a walk. So I walked out to my most favorite tree. The entire walk out here, I sobbed my fucking eyes out, and I just finally got to the point where I didn't care who saw. I didn't care who saw me crying. A bunch of people saw me as they walked by. I just waved and kept going. I have my headphones on. It is what it is. Uh, oh. I just... I was so upset I didn't care. And that, I, I can't even begin to tell you how, how fucking miraculous that was. It was insane. Like, I should be hurt. I should be ashamed. I should be hiding these tears. And I just didn't care. My heart was broken. And I was so very proud of myself at the same time. Um, so I took some pictures. I have selfies of me crying because I can do that now. <laughs> I have a face. It is my face. It is not my mother's face. Yay! Here's the proof. I'm crying. I'm crying in front of a camera. <laughs> it feels just kind of wicked to take selfies when you're crying like, oh, how could you? But I get to. And it's liberating. And it's proof. It's proof that I'm not my mom. Anyway, um, I got out to the most favorite tree, which is my favorite tree, obviously. But he's, he's kind of acquired his own 
personality, like a minor demigod. And um, I go out there when I'm really stressed and I just can't even anymore because I don't have a strong figure to lean on out here in Florida. And yeah, that's probably something I'm going to have to deal with at some point. Um, my mom is damaged and takes it out on other people. My dad is her support. My dad backs her on anything unquestioningly, uncritically. Um, he thinks that I look my mom, like my mom and does not see me as a separate person. Um, if I try to do anything that's separate from her or different than she would do, I get instant feedback that that's that I'm being a bad person or I'm selfish or something like that. Oh, you're just like, you know, like the more I try not to be like my mother, the more I'm just like my mother. Um, it's, it's a crack up. He's never been anyone I could lean on. Like he's, he's my favorite parent of the two, but he is unreliable as shit. Hey, he's, he's a very quote unquote objective person who has no sense of his own personality or boundaries or what's too much or too little. He just doesn't get it. And I know why that is for him too. So it's easier for he, for me to deal with him because he didn't wasn't the active parent to be lashing out at me and hurting me, but he also wasn't there. Um, so <laughs> in lieu of having a father figure, I have a big ass tree. And you, let me tell you, this big ass tree fucking rocks. Uh, that tree is always there, um, even if it's always kind of a grumpy tree. <laughs> Not that my dad's always grumpy, just, uh, it's a grumpy tree. It just is a grumpy tree. I, I've, I've had other trees that have done this with, uh, that are my tree, my most favorite tree. This is the one I've been closest to because I, I don't have a lot of other support and my heart just has to reach out to something sometimes. So I'm out there. I sobbed on the tree and I hugged one of the branches that's just right there. <laughs> I'm a tree hugger. I, I, I'm not normally a tree hugger, but today I, I freaking was. I'm out there sobbing and crying in the tree and I feel I'm feeling, feeling slowly better as I let it all out finally. And then I come out here to talk to a bunch of invisible people who may or may never listen. <laughs> Hello, hypothetical listeners. Thank you for listening. Um, I, the real point of coming out here, I think, was to say all of this, all of this upset today and over the course of writing this book, it has been good and right and necessary. I'm grateful for how hard this book has been to write. I am grateful to walk out here sobbing my fucking eyes out. I am grateful for the opportunity to either have someone listen to me or not have someone listen to me, but to be able to toss something out in the world and go, I made it. And... I'm, I'm absolutely grateful that the parts of me that are most terrified of going through this, of opening up, of sharing anything, of taking any kind of chances whatsoever, the parts of me that are most terrified are the most hurt. They're the, they think the worst of themselves. They hate themselves they they feel weak and broken and lost unkind ugly terrible pieces of shit and yet they're letting me do this even if it's slow and difficult at times and I feel like 
I should be able to go faster and be more freely. And I should. If I could do it for, for someone else, then I should be able to do this for myself. I should be able to treat myself as well as I treat my clients. I should be able to treat myself 10 times better. But I'm so grateful. The most hurt part of me stepped up and said, I'm not going to hurt my daughter. I'm not going to hate the world. I'm going to choose, I'm going to choose love over apathy. I'm going to choose creativity over shutting down. I'm going to choose being hurt over being afraid. I've seen so many people make other choices and it makes me so sad. And it makes me so very grateful that I have chosen the things that I've chosen. Even if I do end up getting rid of the most scared, hurt parts of me. Even if I do absorb them into a greater whole that doesn't have to feel so scared or so hurt or so abandoned or so lost or so locked up in her neck and her chest and her throat. Even if that part of me goes away, it's what got me here. I, I left my ex and I left my ex scared. I left terrified. But I left. I left my mom ashamed. I left my mom hating myself. I left my mom having no boundaries. I left my mom not for myself, but so she couldn't lash out at my daughter as my daughter got to be a teen. But I left. Every time I set a boundary with someone, I set a boundary out of a sense of guilt. I set a boundary out of a sense that I failed them. I, I set a boundary thinking what could I possibly do? How could I possibly bend over backwards so that I wouldn't have to say no to them? But I set boundaries anyway. That part of me fights so hard to control everything around me. And it, it go, and yet still has a self-awareness to go, this isn't healthy, this isn't right, this isn't what I want. It still goes, even if it destroys me, I will choose something else. I will choose a step forward, even if it means giving up everything I know now. I will take that risk because I don't want to be the person that I am. Change feels like death. And even the most scared, terrified part of me is like, I would rather die than stay here. And I am proud of that. I'm really proud of that. Yeah. It doesn't make it any easier. Wow, it feels terrible. I don't know what that noise is, but it sounds bad. Yeah. Anyway, God, it sucks. I cried all the way out here. I felt like shit. But I didn't shut down. I didn't go flat. I didn't let fear rule me. I just hurt and I was sad. So, I guess uh, if you get anything out of this at all, please take with you. Take with you the sense of failure. Take all the broken parts and just know that is it's all there is that can see you through. The things that helped you defend you when you were small, that helped you try and stay stable and sane and safe, they can't help you now, but they got you here. And if you have to break those things, if you have to throw them away, 
I think they're okay with that. They would much rather have a feeling of security, of being held, of being cherished, of being understood, being loved, being able to love and to care for and to cherish and keep other people secure and protected than they would to still feel the strength in that brokenness. The broken parts can go. You can let them go. And they will say, thank you 